I would really love to get, I mean, I would have loved to have just questions and answers. That always makes it easier for me to know what you want to know and to try and discuss that. But uh, let me give a little context. I think that's what Shalini wanted me to do uh, so that uh, we get those questions and answers. But please do give me questions and answers. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, good, good, good. So I, I just want to say I am, you know, I came from a normal middle class family like I guess most of you do. Dad was in the army. Mother was uh, a doctor, but a teaching medical doctor. She retired as head of preventive and social medicine at Mulan Azad Medical College. And so I grew up in that environment. Uh, born in Calcutta, seven years there. Then my, we moved to Delhi, uh, went to Columbus for four years. And then my dad got pulled up for the 62 war. Uh, some of you may have read about it with China. And uh, my mother got a postdoctoral fellowship uh, from Ford Foundation to go and do postdoctoral work at the Harvard School of Public Health. So both the children had to be put into boarding schools. And so my sister went to Tarahal Simla, where my mother knew the mother superior. And I ended up at Dune School, where I did my schooling, my last four years of schooling. Uh, did my senior Cambridge in 64. In 65, joined IIT Kharagpur. Why did I go to Kharagpur? I don't know how you guys do it, but in our time, no one had the time to read those long prospectuses that all these IITs send out. So I wanted to do electronics. And all the other, all the five IITs had a department of electrical engineering. Kharagpur had a separate department of electronics and electrical communication engineering. So I thought, look, at a high level, something's got to be different. Because everyone else just has electrical and they have a separate department. So that's why much against my family's wishes, at least my grandmother's wishes, I went to Kharagpur uh, to do my electronics. It's a decision I haven't regretted uh, till now because it actually changed my life in a lot of ways. So like most of us when we graduated, everyone was applying overseas. So was I, like everyone else. Uh, you know, I'm a sucker for logic. So I remember my mother sent me a cutting for a DCM senior management trainee job in which I still remember the one line. She said, interviews are like exams. The more you do, the better you are at them. And I thought that was really made sense from a logical point of view. So just to acknowledge that, I filled up that application form and I sent it off to uh, DCM. And then you graduate, you come to Delhi, you're working on your visa and you're doing all that stuff. I had another classmate of mine, and again, those of you who've uh, done engineering especially, you got these really smart guys who are very nervous. So on the way to the exam hall, they'll ask you, oh, Taylor's theorem, I'm sure all the questions are going to be there. I haven't even read it here. What is Taylor's theorem? You know, stuff like that. But the guy knows what he is doing. So I had this friend of mine, and he was very keen for the DCM job. So he told me, why don't you do the test? I'll copy from you. If I get caught, or we get caught, you don't care. I'm willing to take the risk. Again, logic. So I went and did the test and, you know, uh, they say IITK Ustad, who's going to catch us copying? <laughs> Topoing is the word, basically. And so we did that and then my interview was a day before his and he said, go check the questions. And uh, what happened is that he didn't get through. I got called for the final interview. Now what happens is some 8,000, 12,000 people apply. 30 people are called for the final interview and they'll take some 8 or 12 people. And so then it becomes an ego issue. So I went for the final interview and next thing I know I get a telegram saying you've got the job, 950 rupees a month located in Delhi. Now I don't know how to describe 950 rupees a month was a lot of money in 1970. And especially when you're staying at home, I mean I could have coffee every day at the Uburai coffee shop if I wanted. It was that kind of money. So after a little bit of deliberation, actually my dad was very keen. I still wanted to go abroad. Uh, what kept me in India was where So my best friend uh, in college was, is now my brother-in-law. Uh, he, I mean, the, he, his trip in life was, he said, I don't care what I do in life. I want to make money. My trip in life was I want to go do research, teaching, and you know, uh, that's the career I want. It's strange, he is now a professor at MIT in Boston and I ended up starting a company. But the reason I sort of stayed back in India was 
I, I knew who I wanted to get married to. And so I talked to her father and he of course said, you crazy, I can't get my daughter married to someone who doesn't have a job. So he said, you have to have a confirmed job before I can agree to this. And I thought if I go to the US, it'll take me seven years by the time I do my PhD, take a job, come back. And I was a little worried that family pressure, you know, she might commit somewhere else. So I took the DCM job with the clear understanding that I'll work there for one year, get confirmed, get married, and once you're married, then you can go abroad. No one's going to say anything. <laughs> yeah. You know. Now what happened was DCM decided to get into electronics. And unfortunately, I was probably the only electronics engineer they had in the company. And so I got called up. Imagine one year out of college, all you've gone through is a training program in DCM. A nice training program. It's like an MBA you do. Uh, materials management, marketing management, uh, personnel management, and then you go and work in a unit and write a proposal and you report only to the general manager as a senior management trainee. So it was a really great program. Uh, but I get called to the executive director's office and he says, we started this electronics division it's called DCM data products. You're either going to head production and R&D or you're going to head sales and marketing depending on who we can find. And so they found someone from ITI in Bangalore who took over production and R&D and I was handling sales and marketing. So I actually went and bought a Kotler because I want to know what is this marketing thing they talk about here. And I'm supposed to handle this for this new product on a national basis. And so I thought, where am I going to get this kind of responsibility? So I stayed back and I actually kept my admission in Stanford open for five years till they said, now you've got to redo your GMAT. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to. After this, I probably forgotten most of my engineering. I'm not going to do my GMAT. But we did a lot of good stuff in DCM. And again, if you ever, I don't know how much of it is on the web, but we did have a large market share. We were pretty big in that business. DCM ran into trouble on a whole different thing. They made some bad bets on cotton buying. And so they ran into big losses. And uh, they basically said that no increments for the next two years. Now that's fine for traditional uh, businesses like urea and cotton and food. But electronics, we were a growing business. We had all young people. And this sort of didn't make sense to us. So that's one thing that happened. The other thing that happened is we had built a big R&D team in DCM. Uh, we weren't just selling calculators by putting chips and putting them on a printed circuit board and putting them in a cabinet with keyboard. We were actually writing some PROMs and doing some work to add functionality to a standard chip. So we had special machines that actually were getting good market traction, good margins and, uh, you know, good price, I mean, uh, good uh, market share. We had also developed a programmable calculator and a computer based on both bit slice. And I'm not sure how many engineers here Anyone know bit slice? You know microprocessors for sure, right? So based on microprocessors. Now, again, I don't know if you know those days, uh, India was a socialist country. It's still coming out of that uh, phase. But we had something called the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act, which meant that big companies couldn't get into, big private companies couldn't get into new areas of business. And uh, how many of you have worked here? Okay. So you probably aware that uh, the job of legal departments and uh, administrative departments and companies is to tell you how you can't do things. They don't tell you how you can do things. You ever run across that problem? Yeah, it's the same. It hasn't changed. So DCM was told by their internal legal people that they can't get into computers. It'll run afoul of the act. We just felt microprocessors were just coming out. It was a technology that had the ability to change the way computers were looked at. IBM and ICL were the big competitors here and they were selling really old technology. So we thought let's go out and you know make computers with microprocessors and change the world. So actually originally nine of us left DCM. Three decided that they didn't want to take the risk and they ultimately went off to the Gulf, got jobs there and stuff like that. But six of us stayed back and started what is now known as HCL. Actually, originally it was called Microcomp because we had no business plan, we had no money, right? And uh, we only had a passion, I guess, and we thought we knew the market. And of course, microprocessors were going to change the world. 
So we pulled in all our provident fund and stuff like that. I still remember I <coughs> asked my mother for a loan of 25,000 rupees to put in my piece of the equity or part of my equity. And she said, I will give you whatever I have in my checking account, but I am not going to take a loan from my provident fund to fund this because <laughs> I don't know where this thing is going to go. No one's ever done business in the family before. And so, and you know, of course, lots of family pressure from uncles and aunts thinking I was crazy to give up a job in a big company, you know, all that kind of stuff and do something that no one in the family had done before. But in any case, I was telling people earlier, two or three years later when the company did well, they all took credit for it. But that's a different point altogether. So we started HCL actually, initially we started, we didn't know what to do. We just knew we want to do this. Again, you know, it's a, I don't know, call it luck, call it whatever. There, there's a television company called Televista. Have you heard of it? Yeah. So Televista had got into calculators, but they weren't successful in calculators. So Ved Luthra, who's the CEO, founder of Televista, he came and talked to us and said, why do you guys want to get into manufacturing? I'm manufacturing. Sell my calculators. I'll tell you what my cost of manufacturing is. You tell me what your cost of sales is. There's a profit in the middle. At half that price, half the profit is mine, half is yours. We'll give you a 90-day hundi, which means that I pay after 90 days. So I get 90 days credit from my supplier, and yet I can collect money from the market. So technically, we were cash positive in the first 15 days. I still remember I, uh, we redid the prices. The printer calculator was being sold at 7,000 rupees. We decided to price it at 5,500 because there were enough margins in it. I remember two of us were posted to Calcutta. I had a look at where their prospects were. Uh, there was a company on Taratala Road called Das Reprographics who were, uh, seemed to be interested in a printer calculator. So the demo machine I had in office, we cleaned it up. I went there to Taratala Road. I met them, gave them a demonstration. Uh, they liked it. And I said, you know, at what price would you buy it? He said, I'll buy it for 6,000 rupees. I said, I'll give it to you for 5,500 if you give me the check right now. And so I picked up the check. I put it in my pocket. I got into the Kalka mail that night from Delhi, uh, from Calcutta. We couldn't afford uh, uh, sleepers. So for eight annas, I bought a seat. You can get a seat on the Kalka for eight annas. So I remember buying that. Got off next evening at Delhi. Stayed, and the office was the Barsati in my house. So I stayed downstairs in the morning. I go to the office and I give them the check. And they said, you know, we haven't opened our bank account as yet. <laughs> in fact, we haven't even got the name clearance for Microcomp. So we can't open the bank account. So then someone scrambled to the registrar of companies, made sure the name clearance came, went to the bank, opened the bank account, and then deposited the check. But So we were cash positive. First, we started 15th October, 31st October, we were cash positive. That went, the calculator business went fairly well. We knew the market. We knew exactly what was going on. Two of us then moved out. Uh, we then actually, since there were two people in each office, two in Calcutta, two in Delhi, and two in Bombay, we said we'll do the South later. Around um, February or so of 76, we felt that the calculator business was going fine. It was generating cash. We should start developing our own computer. So Shiv and I, Shiv Nader and I moved out into the computer business. And the other four people, one person from Bombay went uh, to Madras. And we now had four offices going. Uh, that's how we started HCL, basically. Then we realized we don't have a license to manufacture computers. India had a license raj in those days. And licenses were reserved only for state and public sector. So we actually signed a joint sector agreement with the UP Electronics Corporation. Uh, all of you may know it as Uptron. Uh, we were the first company that was set up there. That's how we didn't have to use the name Uptron. And we thought if people have to buy computers, they have to feel they're buying it from a solid company. So you have to pay a little extra to show high, uh, you know, high capital uh, to get the name Hindustan. So we called it Hindustan Computers Limited. Of course, being joint sector, it got understood that, you know, like Hindustan aircraft, Hindustan machine tools, we were also part of the Hindustan setup. So we were considered a government company. No one ever saw us as a chota private startup, which helped a lot. 
because uh, if someone said oh you're part of the government you never said yes or no you just sort of did the what we call in the north the south indian nod so they don't know whether you're yes or no and uh, sort of let it go at that but that was hcl that's how we started had a lot of fun uh, moved into 8-bit computers well first of all we did gamble in this not gamble we tried to predict technology so we tried to use the latest technology when it came out so just as an example we were the first people to use winchester disk drives sealed disk drives in india we were the first people to use uh, we were a worldwide beta site for sugar for their five and a quarter inch floppies everyone used to use something called an eight inch floppy i don't think you've even seen floppies but there used to be an eight inch floppy we were the first one that five and a quarter inch the whole market was on eight inch and you know in a way we had to fight that till it became the standard and so people started accepting hcl as the one that would give them the standard in technology that we had the ability to predict the way technology was going which is a great position to be in so we made our 8-bit machine the way we used to make it was take a 30 percent advance and uh, you know that would cover our bill of materials there was nice margin in it and uh, we had our first customer he was ready with the 70 percent check and we were ready to deliver and someone comes to us and tells us have you paid your excise said, hey, what is excise said you know in India when you produce something there's a production tax it's called excise so you have to pay your excise so we called the excise inspector and said here yeah, the machine tell us what excise do we have to pay it ad volarum which is on a percentage of the value or like transformers you pay four annas per kilo by weight so what is the excise so he looks through the book and he can't see any microcomputer mini computer microprocessor base there's nothing in, in the book so he said look there's nothing in the excise manual so what you've got to do is go to your administrative ministry ask them to write a letter to the finance ministry the finance ministry will then give a clarification and on that basis we can get this cleared I said you crazy i mean writing to two ministries is going to take four or five months i have a customer he's ready with the check so he said no 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 this is revenue generating for the government so they'll do it in one day okay so we go to uh, the, i remember it was saturday we used to work half day saturday we go to the department of electronics just be informed because electronics is the future and all that and we give them our pitch and say you know write a letter to the finance ministry so department of electronics says hey hang on the microprocessor policy has still not been decided we expect it to take four years so please come back four years later and then we'll talk about this so think about it you know you've got a machine ready you've got customers ready they've paid you money what do you do so we all went back home very dejected took the excise thing and said let's read it import substitution was a big thing in india in those days because foreign exchange was very tight and we used to import a electromechanical accounting invoicing machine from east germany called robotron and there was a photograph of the robotron machine it had a keyboard it had a display and it had a printer and so we called the exercise there and said, look at this and look at our machine. He said, hey, you got a keyboard, you got a printer. So for four years, we cleared a machine as an accounting invoicing machine. We even sold one to the Department of Electronics, by the way. That policy did take four years. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what India was like in those days and how you had to do business. And, uh, you know, so a lot of times when kids today come and tell me how frustrated they are, I always give them this story and say you know here the whole company had no chance because of this and we had to come up with a solution and so there's always a solution if you look for it and it's somewhere there and you'll always find it but in any case you know the hcl story you know you know what it is like uh, in fact uh, i went off uh, i had a midlife crisis in 19 10 years after we started uh, 1984 or so I don't know if you know what a midlife crisis is. Well, I guess let, let me spend a moment on that then. So what happens with most people is when you leave college, you're 21 or so, you want to change the world. When you get close to 40, you suddenly think, hey, what have I done? Most of my life is over. I haven't really changed the world. You know, I've got into a routine. I'm doing the normal stuff. And it's sort of a little depressing. So you get into this, what should I do? etc i got into it too and said you know maybe i should go back do my phd and teach like i always wanted to teach and stuff like that so i talked to my other partners and basically i said you know what i want to do is 
I had a cottage in Missouri. I said, I'm going to take three months off, go to the cottage, sort of meditate and sort of decide what I want to do with my life. And everyone said, you crazy, three months later, you'll be as confused as you are right now. So they said, why don't you go do a course, you know, meet people who are from outside this environment and then decide. And so I went off to Harvard in early 85 to do something called the Advanced Management Program. It's a, it was a 13 week course at that time. And I think that did a lot of good because two things I realized. I realized that when people talked about a billion dollars, I used to feel a little scared. But to most Americans, it was, wasn't much. But when people talked about managing thousand people, I used to feel, hey, that's easy. I've done that. And for most of them, that was really tough. Because how do you manage so many people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you sort of discovered where your strengths were and where you needed to bolster your strengths. And I also, I used to avoid finance until my finance professor at Harvard uh, told me that the, if you have to analyze the balance sheet in five minutes, uh, you use what is called the Samuelson formula. Samuelson was the CFO of General Motors and uh, he was an electrical engineer by training. So that sort of things, okay, if he could do it, I can do it. And the Samuelson formula, I'm not sure they teach it to you, is very simple. It's profit upon sales is equal to profit upon equity into equity upon assets into assets upon sales. And each of those ratios tells you something about how the company is performing. Okay, so just think about it and talk to your finance people. I'm sorry if I'm increasing the load. But uh, to me, it's, I use it all the time when I look at a balance sheet. Of course, you've got to different balance sheets, club things differently. So you've got to be a little smart to club it. But it basically tells you your asset intensity. It tells you how profitable you are, how the basic profitability of the business. And sort of when you have to take a quick decision, that's the best five, 10 minute way to look at a balance sheet and come up with a quick answer. And you should take some public balance sheets and do it and see what the differences are. And you'll understand different businesses, how they sort of, what the asset intensity, how many times they rotate the assets, how efficient they are, what's the profitability of the core business. Uh, it's really, so that's one thing I remember I learned at Harvard that has stood me in good stead. Of course, there are lots of other things you learned that, uh, that helped. Basically, when I came back from uh, there, I realized what I was not enjoying was running a big company. By that time, we had 2,000 plus people. We were in, I don't know, 300 offices around the country. Uh, you know, it wasn't a startup. And I was missing the fun of being in a startup. So I came back and I told everyone that, look, uh, 13 weeks, whoever ran the company, they should keep running it. I'm not getting back to my original job. I'd like to do something new. I'd like to, you know, do all the new startups and stuff like that. And basically, they said, great idea, but you can't only have fun. It's not fair. So you do the startups and any division that runs into a problem, you also have to take care of that, which I thought was fair. Like, you can't only have fun. So then I started something called CAD CAM, which I think is, a, in, a, in some way, if I look back, the m most interesting part of my life because I actually used my engineering knowledge attached it to computers to solve engineering problems in organizations, right? So we started the CAD CAM division, which actually was the first time people sold solutions in India. And uh, on the other side, our reprographics division ran into problems. Uh, Modi Xerox had come up. We were selling copiers and they were selling copies. I think it's a, it's a different business. We were profitable for a while and then suddenly we fell off the cliff and we fell off the cliff really fast. So the talk internally was to shut it down and I said, look, you can't shut down or sell it. I said, no use selling a division when it's making a loss. Let's at least turn it around and then look at what we want to do with it. So, you know, the problem with opening your mouth in board meetings is then they say, okay, then you do it, right? So I ended up running reprographics. We actually changed the business model. Actually, the most important thing was, I still remember, um, you've got to get those people who've been losing for six, eight months to start believing in themselves. And I still have that handwritten note that my Delhi regional manager gave me when I went off to the US a year later. And the key line in that is, thank you for giving us back our self-respect. And I think that's the key. People have to believe in themselves to be able to deliver. So when you manage people, just remember, yelling at them doesn't get you the result. You have to make them believe that they can do it. 
And in fact, uh, let me put it this way, a manager's job is probably the most difficult job. Everyone thinks so when I get a, become a manager, I can take it easy. That's not true. Because when you become a manager, you have a team with you. Your job is to see where the weakness in the team and overcome that weakness as part of that team. So you really can't choose what you want to do. You have to do what covers the weakness in the team, whether you like to do it or not. That's a manager's job. It's also a manager's job to make sure that his or my boss cannot fire someone who reports to me when I'm in the room. Because if he does, then I have to step into the middle and take the yelling, even if it's not my fault. Remember, that's your job. And yet, when you've done something that's really nice and your boss is patting you on the back, you've got to step out of it and say, hey, the team did it, and let them take the credit. Part of what that does is that they will never let you down because they feel guilty about your taking the rap for them. And of course, everyone feels good when they get a pat on the back. So just remember, being managers is not an easy job. I mean, they, I don't know how they teach this in a business school, but when you go out and work, you've got, as you go higher in the organization, your ego should, in my view, become less and less. You end up doing the jobs that other people don't do. Also, don't ever ask someone to do something that you wouldn't do. Because if you ask them and they say no, and you don't do it too, nothing happens. But if you go and do it, the next time he'll find, he or she will find it very difficult to say no to you because they know you'll end up doing it. And that's not something they want everyone to see. So sorry, yeah, that was a deviation from where I went. But I found that helps. And so reprographics, then we actually, uh, again, if you read history, that's the first time we did comparative advertising in India where we said Xerox has this, I have this, which one is better? And actually, I was stopped. I wanted to get into a challenge. Let's get your copy or my copy and let's run them in front of prospects and see which one does, works faster, gives better output or all that stuff. Uh, as Shiv said, it was going a little too far, which it probably was. But yeah, so we, we actually then became the biggest in copiers. And then I went off to the US uh, to look at HCL America. We had, uh, what had happened at HCL was, Unix had, you know, when Rajiv Gandhi came in, they changed the policy and allowed sources, source code to be imported. And Unix was available in source code. So we imported Unix, put it on our commercial machines, added uh, features like uh, spoolers and stuff like that, and actually uh, had a really nice commercial Unix machine, which they didn't really have in the US. Unix was used mainly for research, you know, universities. What also happened is that everyone in India reads English magazines, especially the technical magazines. But India was aligned to the Eastern Bloc, to Russia. And so a lot of latest technology, latest chips were restricted coming into India. And so uh, when the Motorola 68000 series came, you know, when we had the 68020, the 030 had come out, but we weren't allowed to get it into India for a long time. And customers want that, see, because they all read those magazines. So we went into a multiprocessor architecture. And really, what was nice was we had a multiprocessor machine that worked really well, had multiple terminals and all, better than performance than the 030 single chip. But to the user, it was as if running single user Unix. So he didn't have to learn any extra programming or whatever to do it. At one of the exhibitions here, AT&T had bought Unix. The AT&T vice president for Unix had come and he saw this and he really freaked out. He said, you know, machines of this kind are made by Pyramid and MIPS in the US and they cost a million dollars. Whereas you guys are talking about a machine that you can sell for under $100,000. And so he said there should be a market. So we got McKinsey to do a study for us. And sure enough, they said there's a market. And so HCL computers went to America. It was called Brain Brain Drain. Our computers are going to the US. And so we went there. We had a beautiful order, $50 million OEM. We were porting that OS, uh, adapting that OS to work on our machine. When that company got bought by a company called SCI. SCI is, uh, uh, they used to make motherboards. And they, felt that they only wanted to go with the Motorola and with the Intel uh, 80386, uh, that series. 
we were Motorola based. So all of a sudden that order became a piece of paper. Now a couple of things happened along with that. Uh, Yogesh Vedya who had gone there to start the unit had to go for a multiple bypass. And in those days bypasses weren't that common. Although he said he'd be back at work in 10 days, we thought he was going to overstrain himself. And so I was asked to go in and basically shut down the unit in an organized way so that the noise doesn't come back to India because we've taken a lot of mileage about HCL computers going abroad and you know all that kind of stuff. So I go to the US and uh, shut down the hardware part because and you know in hindsight I could have gone legal and won but when you go with the in India you never go with that mindset of being legal. Here you try and sort things out uh, across the table rather than go to the court because the courts take a long time. So I, you know, shut down the hardware. I went to, you know, and so we had a number of people working with enabling technologies, databases, compilers that we were porting onto our machine that were used in the US, Unify, Informix, uh, Microfocus, you know, people like that. And the way we'd done it was we had said that we won't charge you for our engineers. We'll do the microprocessor extensions on your software for free but I, I don't charge me porting fees. So when we shut the hardware, I wrote to all these people and said, hey, I'm pulling my engineers back because I don't need to do this. All of them responded and said, we'll pay you. We need these microprocessor extensions. So we'll pay you for these engineers. And in those days, people like TCS and all were drawing $35 an hour, $25, $27 an hour. We were, they offered to pay us $45 an hour. Now that comes to about $8,000 in a month. There was no H visa stuff in those days. Everyone was on B visa and working. My cost of the engineer there was $3,000 a month. So I was making $5,000 a month on these engineers. Right. So all of a sudden I had a business. I had a cash flow. I mean I was in business there in something that we hadn't anticipated at all. It's what you now know as HCL technologies. That's how it started. Right because we had a business. We always thought our engineers should be used for R&D. Programmers are people that NIT trained, not engineers. But we went into porting, which is really an R&D activity, which is what HCL is really strong at even today. And that's how that whole thing started. In fact, uh, uh, I, India was very happy because I wasn't asking for money. I, there was no bad news coming out of the US. So they were very happy. They, were, they didn't want to ask any questions. And then in 91, if you remember what happened, remember, I don't know if you guys were around, <laughs> VP Singh was the uh, Prime Minister, uh, someone called Rajiv Goswami burnt himself, it was in the cover of India Today, stuff like that, recession in India and all over the world. And in a recession, the first thing that gets hit is computers and office equipment. So India ran into a big cash problem. And I was sitting with a lot of money in the US because, hey, I had losses from earlier, I was making profit, but I didn't have to pay any tax. So what we ended up doing, I, I didn't have any official way of transferring money to India. So what we ended up doing is buying our instruments factory, the HCL instruments factory in Udyog Vihar, uh, Gurgaon, just across the border from Delhi for a million dollars. And that's how I had a back end in India that we ended up doing. And then of course, you know, in 92, 93, we did a joint venture with HP. And HP said very clearly, I don't need your overseas unit. I mean, I don't need you in the US. I've got enough stuff in the US. I just want the Indian unit to, for access to the Indian market. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting in HCL America without a back end in India. So I had to come back and set up my whole back end, which again is how HCL tech became different from the traditional HCL because when HP bought them, I was left without a back end in India. So I had to come back and invest in my own back end at HCL America, then HCL, HCL overseas, then to HCL consulting, and finally it's now known as HCL Technologies. So again, I, the reason I gave that story was a lot of, you know, people talk strategy all the time, and everyone thinks strategy is what gets you there. Yes, strategy is important, but unless you have your ear to the ground, and unless you take the, how do I put it? You've got to play, uh, you've got to play your card, you've got to play, run your life with the cards you're dealt. 
don't try and find cards you're not dealt right and when you're dealt sometimes you get a good hand and you got to know it's a good hand and chase it instead of saying hey this is not what i'm going to do or this is not what i should be doing this is not i what was originally planned in the strategy right so i that's why i'm trying to mention a lot of things which were how should i put it circumstances got you there and then you took advantage of that and built it into what it looks like a very successful company today of course when you go to uh, there's a case at there's a case at howard there's a case at the im amdabad where the story is a little different because you can't say hey i just did it as something that happened by accident or by or just because it happened so there's a bit of strategy and thinking and stuff in it but bottom line is this is what really happened right so i came back uh, to india in 96 the whole idea was hcl was doing a lot of joint ventures and stuff like that i also you know the internet had come and i wanted to be playing at the edge of the internet it was a very interesting technology hcl's attitude and rightly so it was a public company was that you know let's look at the trend and once we see the trend then let's invest heavily behind it and be part of the trend you know that's not fun the fun is when you're right at the edge and things are changing every day and you're looking at technology so i thought look uh, i went back to why did i first start uh, start the company and i started the company saying i want the economic freedom to do what i want to do now i didn't know at that age at 25 or so what i wanted to do but i said at some stage i'll figure out what i want to do and i'll want the economic freedom to be able to do it what happened was and i also said you know obviously the family should feel comfortable and stuff like that so i think 3 or 4 years later i was on the road 20 25 days a month and my wife told me you know by that time i had two kids my i when we started i had a kid so my wife told me you know time to spend some time with the kids and i told her look i'm having too much fun right now you and my parents can take care of the kids right let me enjoy what i'm doing and so in a lot of ways i actually missed out my kids growing up and they still haven't forgiven me for it and uh, i still get into trouble when i spend time with my grandchildren because my kids keep telling me but you never did that with me and so i keep trying to tell them that the difference between grand and kids you know it's <laughs> in fact uh, on an aside i saw a sticker in a car bumper in california which i thought was very good it said if i'd known grandchildren were so much fun i would have had them first <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but yeah to get back to this so basically you know hcl started working you know went through said i was 50 i thought 50 is a good time to retire i made enough money let me do what i want to do so i negotiated my release from hcl it took me a year and a half i still think another major achievement it was done amicably I mean you've seen brothers split with brothers fighting and stuff like that I amicably got out they're still friends I still meet with them once in a while like you know HCL still want some stuff solved from the old days I try and help them out but yeah so I decided I'll work from home that lasted 10 days so my wife sat me down you know unfortunately I was kept telling her ye yahan kyun hai wo wahan kyun hai ye she sat me down and said you know we've been married for 27 years I married you for good or bad but I didn't marry you for lunch. <laughs> so I will pay for a business center you go work for a business center. I can't take this at home this house is run without you. You know. So I ended up starting another company we actually what happened was uh Goldman Sachs wanted to come into this business in India into the IT services business. and uh, they wanted someone to help them do what is called industrial due diligence they could do the financial part but they wanted someone to do the industrial due diligence and so someone approached me and said would you be willing to do it and i said sure as soon as i leave hcl i'll be free i can do that so i was doing that for goldman sachs and we looked at a number of companies uh goldman sachs wanted a squeaky clean company now unfortunately india had a myriad of laws it was very difficult or impossible to find a squeaky clean company i give you a simple example we had a law called fera uh, foreign exchange regulation act if you had an overseas outstanding receivable 
that was more than 180 days you were supposed to go legal so technically if you didn't go legal and it came in the 185th day you were still in contravention of fera and to that was not okay with goldman so i told them you know after doing this for a few months i told them look you're wasting my time you're wasting your time you're not going to find a squeaky clean company if you want one why don't we start one and keep it squeaky clean so they said okay tell us how to do that so i had some old hcl guys who had started a company called scansoft and they used to keep telling me come in and join us as chairman and i figured they didn't need a chairman they needed money so i was sort of avoiding them so i called them up and said hey goldman sachs willing to put in some money give me a business plan so when people hear the word goldman sachs they think oh lots of money so they made a big business plan they pulled in some other people blah blah and ultimately they needed someone to run it so i got pulled into that too and so in october 98 Uh, we got we signed our uh, term sheet with goldman and uh, company called walden international and one of our hcl founders guy called subhash arora in singapore he put in some money or he said he put in some money and so we decided to take a couple of months off to just make a plan and start from 1st of january 1999 and again those of you who remember a little bit of history that's when the bubble came up you remember the bubble where e-commerce suddenly everyone thought e-commerce will take over the world valuations suddenly went really high in fact I, i used to tell people if i had a dead body i could get you 45 dollars an hour in the us because people just needed bodies everyone was desperately trying to do programming uh, companies went from 0 to billion dollars in 6 months valuation stuff like that we went in at that time went in with a nice business plan i think in 6 weeks we realized look i'm why am i fighting the market the market is going in a certain direction so we switched to e-commerce too completely and in fact in our sixth month in june of 99 in that month we did a million dollars we ended the year at 15.2 million and we were sort of break even slightly not profitable but in the next year year 2000 we did 67 million with 4 million of profit right I mean I can't think of any company that can grow that crazily. So you can imagine we were chasing our tail through this whole thing. Then the bubble collapsed. And when the bubble collapsed, all of a sudden all these high flying companies became worthless. Of course the good news was you could get expensive furniture at throw away prices and stuff like that. You know we survived, we didn't go public. There was a lot of pressure on us to go public because I was being discounted for being profitable. the logic there was you are not investing enough in the future that's why you're making a profit otherwise you should be making a loss and to my basic mind and i'm sorry i'm old fashioned if you're profitable you should be valuable if you're making a loss you should not be that valuable and because that wasn't true we didn't go public because i just couldn't reconcile myself to the fact that i'll be discounted because i'm profitable and then of course the uh, bubble collapsed and slowly things started going downhill in fact uh, our revenues dropped to 27 million in 2 years from that 67 million good news is because you worked in india in a resource uh, constrained environment we kept ourselves cash neutral now in a way i blame myself because my father wasn't well at that time and uh, i spent a lot of time in india and of course everyone thought the market will come back in 3 months and another 3 months and stuff he passed away in august 2001 and so then i had a little more time and i went back and said you know we can't just do nothing we've got to do something so we started looking around and we came across a company okay this is a bit of a story so there was a company there the european investment bank called drkw they got acquired by a company called uh, by dresna bank and dresna got acquired by alliance and i'm sure all of you have heard those names Now the DRKW CIO was a guy called Alnur Ramji and he had built a team of so when we were recruiting from the IITs at 4 lakhs a year he was paying them 7 lakhs a year but he wanted only JE rank below 300 and I mean he just wanted what he considered the best people and he taught them the innards of the investment bank what happened with us was when we decided that we can't do this we said we've got to do something 
So in our wisdom, we decided to do something called, we decided to focus on the capital markets, which is the investment banks in New York and London and stuff. But do it by a strategy that I call uh, asset light. Now what is asset light? So there were people laid off from multiple banks. Goldman laid off, Morgan laid off, you know, everyone laid off. And we used to go to these banks and say, don't come to me for a Java programmer or whatever. I come to me if you want domain expertise. And so Goldman would come and say, I need someone for municipal bonds, muni bonds, I need someone. So at, at these bars in New York, we'd bump into people, there'd be someone from Morgan Stanley who'd been laid off from the muni bonds department. So we talked to him and say, why don't you come on this call with us? If we get the order, I'll give you a job. If we don't get the order, look, you tried, I tried, it's all fine. And that was asset light because the asset was light till you got the business. And that worked really well for us because we got some business and people saw us as domain experts. And on the other side, the people who didn't get the orders remembered that we tried to help them. So when the market came back, it's an incestuous business. They all got jobs in different companies and they all remembered us and called us and said, look, I've got some opportunities for you. So that helped us grow. A Couple of other things happened and again, you know, again, I'm trying to tell you that you've got to, how should I, you've got to play with the cards you're dealt. Gold, there's something in the investment banking business called recall. Now, what happens is when you're balancing your books at the end of the day, you suddenly realize you're half a million IBM uh, shares short. So you call Goldman Sachs, you call Morgan Stanley and say, can I get half a million shares to balance my books? And they have it, they give it to you. Now, when they want it back, you want to be the most inefficient because you'd rather they take it back from someone else. So that process is completely manual. It's like, I send you a fax, I'll call you and say, oh, but I didn't get your fax, can you send it again? And you know, people tend to look very inefficient in that area. Now, Goldman wanted us to automate that for them. And we were doing that for four years in India. So externally, they looked inefficient, but internally, we had got them all on the computer. Uh, yeah, the, it was automated. When the US decided to go to T plus zero and T plus one and T plus zero, that means all transactions have to be cleared instead of two days in one day and then instantaneously. Recall was one area that the Securities Industries Association was very worried about that how are they going to do this because it's fully manual. And Goldman at that time stood up and said, well, you know, we have these guys who've done it for us. So we were called into the Securities Industries Association as experts to tell them how to do recall, automate recall management. And so when you get positioned as experts in the association, it's a great positioning because all our competitors, whether TCS or Infosys or even Capgemini are seen as giving programmers, not giving that expertise, not coming in as experts. What this uh, DRKW Alliance thing happened, they decided to become Eurocentric when that slowdown happened and they started closing everything in Asia. So we bought their Bangalore unit, bought it in the sense, we took over the lease, we took over the equipment, and we gave jobs to everyone, right? And I had now had domain expertise in India, which even Accenture didn't have. So we started getting jobs from, like I got a Bank of America uh, $12 million, or $36 million three-year contract, where I was doing the development, and Accenture in India was doing the QA. And I still remember Accenture got really upset and went to Bankam and said, hey, I'll post a guy from the US to India, why don't you give me the development? And Bankam said that, look, we want you to make money. If you post a guy from the US, cost will be so high, you guys probably won't make money. You won't do a good job for us, or you won't be motivated to do a good job for us, so we'd rather leave it in this particular way. So headstrong, and okay, so that was one part. And then uh, the other thing that happened was, Headstrong is the erstwhile James Martin and company. So if you remember, HCL had a joint venture with them in the Y2K days uh, called HCL James Martin, and I was actually chairman of that joint venture. James Martin had morphed. They thought the name was too staid during the bubble. They changed it to Headstrong. They got a British advertising agency, and for whatever reason, they chose the name Headstrong. Headstrong had got they had taken $200 million from this private equity group 
in the last quarter of 2000 and boom right after they took the money the market collapsed I don't know what they did and how they spent 140 million of that in two years I just don't know I, I don't know how to spend 140 million in two years uh, but they did it and so the private equity group called Welch Carson was planning to close them down uh, they were looking to go offshore in India to try and save some costs but small companies they were worried cannot scale up and big companies they thought uh, the value was too high and so we ended up doing working with them to set this up and uh, one thing led to the other we ended up getting merged and it was like a palace coup they were 60 million dollar company we were 27 million dollar company but we ended up running the joint company and that's how headstrong came that's how we started focusing on the capital markets grew that business to about 220 million with a very strong reputation for program management and for domain and capital markets sold it in May 2011 for 550 million to Genpact that was a sweet deal and I left them a few months later uh, and since then I've just been working with a number of startups I'm trying to focus my time on two areas partly on education and trying to do content digital content but a larger part on healthcare trying to see how we can leverage technology to get healthcare to uh, the remote uh, economically backward people in India get them access to doctors on some kind of telemedicine and uh, some very interesting technology that we're using there and I can talk about that uh, later if you want but that's technically what I've been doing everyone asked me when I'm going to retire you know my wife's pretty clear that she doesn't want me in the house so I'm not sure I'm going to retire uh, so that's so I'm the nomad that roams around the world she looks after the family and the kids right now I was telling Shalini last night that she thinks I'm not old enough to look after myself so she wants to travel with me whenever I travel which uh, happens quite often but yeah it's been fun And uh, you know how did I become an entrepreneur I still go back and tell her that I decided to get married I proposed to her when I was 19 and she was 17 I got married to her when I was 22 and she was 20 I still think it's the best decision of my life right and I always tell people that Indians make great entrepreneurs and I'll tell you why because to be a good entrepreneur you've got to have high frustration tolerance and you've got to have high ambiguity tolerance right let me just put that off yeah so if you grow up in India you have high frustration tolerance right because the whole everything around here is very frustrating nothing works the way it's supposed to work so that's a given for everyone in India now think of the biggest decision of your life you probably take it with very little data you depend on your team to tell you what's the right thing to do and by and large you make that decision successful I'm talking of arranged marriages right think of the ambiguity and think of how it impacts you and think of how you do it right and if you can live with that ambiguity what in business is going to face you what can impact you more as a person so just think about it our basic DNA and our environment makes us the best entrepreneurs in the world you just have to think about it that way because you're living it you without realizing you live with the massive amount of frustration and a massive amount of ambiguity most of the time so why let a startup phase you other than some economic pressures and I've got responsibilities and you know that kind of stuff which is, is true and you've got to keep that in mind when you look at the big picture Thank you. I just any questions, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the forum is now open for questions. So anybody who has a question, so please shoot. For their benefit, on work habits, uh, the kinds of work habits that you think will bring success that you have in your personal experience okay. actually yeah that's a that's a good question actually Einstein said it very well it's 99% perspiration and 1% uh, 
inspiration. And you know, if you put in the hard work and you put it in intelligently, not just doing the hard work, it is bound to get you results. You put in smart hard work, let me put it that way. Also start questioning everything. Don't, I mean, how do I put it? Start asking questions all the time. Look at everything you do, whether you do it in your personal life or you do it in office and say, why can't I do it more efficiently? What can I improve in this process? What can I change? And you'd be amazed that if you start thinking that way and looking at everything in that particular way, how many things can be changed? And over a period of time, you'll come up with an idea that actually will change the world, if I use that term. And you'll have the passion to be able to do it and stuff like that. But a lot of people are what I call task-oriented. They just do what they're told to do. And God bless them because they give us the ability to then make the changes that we need to make and be different. But start thinking that way. Start thinking that, look, it takes me 15 minutes in the morning to get ready. What do I do? What's the sequence I follow? Can I change that? Can I do C before B or follow a different sequence that make it more efficient? Uh, it, quicker in time and keep it as efficient or make it more efficient. And I save two, three minutes or whatever. It, you'll be amazed if you start training your mind to think that way, you'll actually come up with... Uh, 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 some very innovative and interesting ideas. I think the second thing is uh, what I was told when I started working as uh, uh, first year after management training, I was sharing an office with this gentleman from IIT Bombay uh, called KJ Gazdar who was running production, 10 years senior to me. And he told me that the simplest way in those days, and we didn't have our telephones the way we had, we had a patch board telephone. So you had to call the operator and tell her to get you a line. He said, you know, the way you'll be successful in business is number one, keep the telephone operator happy. Number two, keep the chaiwala happy. And number three, keep your boss happy in that sequence. Right? <laughs> because if you didn't get, if your telephone operator didn't like you, she'd never give you a call, either in or out, because she had to put that cable in to connect you. And the chaiwala kept you stimulated through the day. If he didn't give you your two, three cups of tea, you weren't going to survive. And of course, your boss is your boss. So, uh, but that's that's basically just. I think there is really no substitute for hard work. And please remember, everyone wants to do interesting work. It doesn't matter what your job is. Eighty percent of the work you do is going to be mundane. Twenty percent is going to be interesting. And the ratio might change a little bit, but it's unlikely to change over time. So you have to find a way of making that eighty percent interesting or find a way of getting that 80% of the work not to be boring. And really what I said was try to think how to improve it, how to make it different, keeps you on your toes. It makes you feel, yes, I'm making a difference in even something that's mundane. And that's how I look at it at least. And that's how I keep myself motivated. It's frustrating at times because you can't find a better solution. Someone's already found it and uh, it's there and you can't make it any better or you can't think of how it'll get better, but you know, that's, the, that's life. But just remember, uh, there's no job in the world where 100%. I mean, you read about it and people talk about it, but ultimately it's that 80, 20. 20% 20 is interesting, 80% is boring. And that's not going to change. It may change temporarily, but over a period of time, it ain't going to change. Mr. Malad. Yeah, sure. I have a question. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, Recently, I read uh, a venture capitalist uh, is insisting upon social responsibility to get the uh, startups going. So, can you kindly share your views on that? Yeah, I think most startups do have social responsibility because I tell people, people ask me, why do you encourage startups? I tell them because as I get older, I want you to make my life easier to live. And most startups are doing something that will make it easier for me to live my life as I get older. And so they do have to that extent social responsibility. You can take it to the other extreme that there are social entrepreneurship where the, the need itself is social. And that's, I do that with the companies I deal with that deal with healthcare, for example. The whole idea there is that I don't want to be dependent on handouts from the government or from other people. So make, make yourself cash neutral or slightly cash positive. So I'm not dependent on someone else to do things, but I still provide a social 
So I'll, I mean, I'll spend a little minute talking about this company Evolco that we're working on. So if you look at what the problem in India is, is today the number of people, because the economy is picking up, the number of patients coming into the healthcare system, they were always there, but they couldn't come into the system because they didn't have the money. But the people who are coming in is growing by about 16% on a fairly large base. Doctors, unfortunately, are only growing by 4%. And to increase my doctors, if I invest today, 10 years later, I'll get more doctors. So the, and every doctor I know today is overworked. So the pressure on doctors is going to go up, at least for the next 10 years, probably longer. So what do I do to, how do I get the doctors to see more patients? So you look at the time doctor spending, look at the area which is non-patient facing and see how you can automate some of that to make it patient facing. And the second thing is, unless I do preventive work, the hospitals are going to get, they're already overcrowded they're going to get even a lot worse. So what we decided to do was, quite unlike the telemarketing systems abroad, where they expect a doctor to be sitting behind the terminal when you come in and talk to them, what we did was develop what is called a clinical DAG, uh, directed acyclical graph. Forget the technical term, it's like an expert system, which replicates what a doctor would ask you if you came in with a complaint. So technically, the system is on the cloud. You come in with a complaint. The guy's got a smartphone or a tablet. He enters it and say Hindi or whatever, Kannada or whatever language. System starts asking questions. He asks and answers them, puts them in the system. When the system has finished asking questions, it takes a snapshot of whatever it's got from you and then connects you to the doctor or the hospital. The doctor then can ask you more questions. And through AI, we capture those questions and over a period of time, we integrate them with our system. So the next time the system's more intelligent or the expert system, if it does 60% of the doctor's work, it'll do 70, 80%. And over a period of time, it'll do close to 90 plus percent. That's basically what you're trying to do. What we do is uh, charge the patient 100 rupees, out of which 70 rupees, the telemedicine operator who's in the village, he makes 30 rupees he gives us because that keeps our database and uh, keeps us cash positive. And that's how it works. So he gets employed in the village. He's earning something like 18, 15, 18, 20,000 a month, depending on the number of patients. 40% is the, what we've seen, and the, if these are published papers. The 40% of the calls do preventive work. So that reduces the load on the hospital from that remote region. And uh, you know, it's a sort of win-win for everyone. You get village employment. You get guys talking to a doctor rather than talking to a witch doctor, so to say. Yeah, we get money so we can do more and more of these telemedicine operators. Uh, you know, and, and sort of, yeah, the, we are, there are problems because, you know, we're working with Ames Patna, for example. They can do up to 2,000 consults a day. Now we're trying to see how they can increase that or we've got to find some alternative place to go to. So those are the things that uh, we do. But yeah, ultimately you will have problems, you'll get solutions. India, we've got some good things going. One is, you're always worried about connectivity in the remote village. That's where this great concept of Jugaad, that's so Indian, comes up. This guy in the village, the telemedicine operator, because he's earning money, he gives a little bit of money to the BSNL guy and puts a booster in his hut. <laughs> so our signal is better than it normally would have been. And that's true Jugaad, true Indian Jugaad. And the other thing is, you're worried about how do I get payment from this guy in the village. So because of a uh, prepaid SIM system, people are mentally used to prepaying. So he prepays and we just adjust against that till it goes to 20%. We send him an SMS and he upset because he's earning money. Otherwise, I'll, connect, I'll disconnect his connectivity to the cloud. So it works really well. My biggest problem is trying to know where my money is at one time because these banks are inefficient. They don't tell me Today, if I want to know where all my cash is, I have no idea because they're in different village accounts. You know, that, that part is still a problem, but it's more a problem with the big banks, not with the um, TMO or whatever. So that's a simple solution. You've got to look at it for India. This is the solution. Now we're getting pressure to do it in Africa. We're getting pressure to do it in Malaysia. In fact, I, just before I came on Thursday, uh, I was talking to the Mohalla Clinic people in Delhi. 
uh, they have the same thing. See, the what they are looking at is with the tablet, I can now go door to door. People don't have to come to me anymore, and I can check it there and collect their database, so to say, and put it. So they are looking at a slightly different application in the, in the Delhi context of going door to door with that guy with the tablet. The key is the person who's the telemedicine operator should not have any healthcare knowledge. He shouldn't start prescribing. Then you are in big trouble. He should just be a completely dumb guy. We'll train him and he should just follow what the system says. Right. Of course, India has its own problems. So we got some complaints from Bihar that the local witch doctor whose business is getting threatened has threatened to kill this guy. So we told the cops. And the cops' view is that unless there's an incident, I can't do anything. So if there's an incident, then I don't need you. <laughs> you know, it's like catch-22, but yeah, that's... I mean, India, you've got, you've got to live with your own problems. But it's fun. It's fun to see, make, you know, go to the villages, you meet people, someone who had eczema for eight years, and in three weeks he gets cured because he talks to a sensible doctor. I mean, just listening to them, to their stories and stuff is quite amazing. In fact, one of our telemedicine operators in Bihar has become the panchayat head. He won the election, and he's now talking of becoming an MLA because he's seen as a local god by those people. And of course, the politicians are all stepping into it. And I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I, I don't need the credit. They can take the credit. As long as we are able to provide that service and do some good, I think that's really... So when you talk social entrepreneurship, I think that's what it amounts to. And there are lots of people doing that. Sorry. See, most people in the village don't have smartphones. They have feature phones, number one. Number two, I need a person because he just doesn't do that. He also has an oximeter, digital oximeter. He has all. So some of the basic, when a doctor sees you, he needs some basic parameters. That gets taken care of. So, and it provides employment in the village. And of course, the employment is not just for men. So we are now seeing that at least two hours, somewhere four hours, you've got to have a woman there because women patients don't come when there are men around. Right. So, you know, there's another company out in Bombay where uh, we've been able to convert village waste, water hyacinths, through a semi-automated process into sanit uh, biodegradable sanitary napkins. And so what we're trying to do is set up these plants in villages, have women manufacture, have women go door to door distributing it so that menstrual health can get taken care of. And it's a big problem in India. If you look at it, it's not, deb it's not a killer, but it's very debilitating. Uh, right, and uh, women around the country, especially, even the women who can afford it, feel shy to go and buy it from the banya. So by sending women door to door, we're trying to see if we can replicate that model. Um, we're seeing better application in Africa. I mean, we're doing more work on this in Africa than we're doing in India. Because in India, the states have their own problem, whatever. There are lots of issues. But, but yeah, those are some of the things we're trying to do. And it's, it's fun. I mean, what's scary is the size of the problem in India. It is really scary. Uh, you know, you, you, when you, you think, like we have 400 villages that are doing it in Gujarat, but that's only scratching the surface. It's, uh, it's just amazing the problem size, that some of these issues, and how long it's going to take to solve them. There's another program going on, and you can see this under Antara Foundation, www.antarafoundation.org, where actually Shiv, myself, and Bill Gates have funded a program to uh, address the problem of infant mortality and malnutrition in a district in Rajasthan, right now, Jalawar district, which is the chief minister's district. And the funny thing is, you don't need money. The government is spending the money. It's not just being spent efficiently. So all we are trying to do is set up a process where I get the Anganwadi worker, the Asha worker, and the midwife to work together, triple A as it's called, so that they, you know, when a child is born, the lady who's supposed to give nutritional advice doesn't know the child is born. So how do you make sure that they sort of, because they're different silos, they're different ministries. Or some is under health, one is under women and child, you know. Break those silos at that village level and make sure that they sort of work together. It's, it's, a, it's heartbreaking to know that the money is being spent, but it's not getting what it's supposed to do. And all you need to do is set up some kind of process and make sure that it's followed and becomes replicable. Right. But that's India for you. The guy out there, he's got a government job. In the, he's the head local district health officer. He's not bothered. He's just, 
he has to produce some statistics. I mean, sometimes it's really you feel like squeezing him by the neck and saying, hey, do something. But yeah, that's India. So lots of work for you guys to do when you grow up. Just remember. How do you ensure that uh, the medicines which are prescribed by doctor, they get dispensed uh, at the ground level? A and B, uh, right now you are working with government hospitals or government institutions. In future, if you want to associate uh, private practitioners with it, what is going to be the business model? Okay. So, uh, so medicines, they go to the local. I don't sell medicines through the TMO. They go to the local guy and get it. Now, if the local chemist doesn't do the right thing, uh, today we can't control it. But we are working on some stuff and I'll come to that in a moment. But yeah, this private thing, so what's happening is at, at Patna, where we're doing this, we're right now only in two districts. There are 57 districts in Bihar. We are already seeing that wait times are going 20 minutes, 45 minutes for the patient because uh, they're backed up. So we've talked to some private practitioners in Patna. Uh, I was very skeptical. I thought, why would a private practitioner do this? What is turning out is very different. So what is turning out is, if I have a clinic, People who are in the clinic are captive. Whether they wait 15 minutes more doesn't make any difference. But this, and we charge 50 rupees extra, which we give the private guy. This 50 rupees is transitionary. If I don't take it, someone else will take it. So they're giving priority to this. It's very counterintuitive, but that's what's happening with doctors. They're giving priority to this online thing rather than to their patients because the patients are captive. They're not going anywhere. So it's starting to work and we're now starting to look at Ayurvedic and we're starting to look at some specialists and we'll have to change the rates and stuff. The bigger problem we have is that the TMO is not charging, he's charging 150. I have no way to control that, whereas it should be 100. So we are now looking at maybe I should send a voice uh, message to the uh, patient to say don't pay more than 100, you know, whatever. But again, this adds cost, that's the whole problem. We're now working with the uh, uh, digital stethoscope that transmits both waveform and sound so I can detect heart murmurs remotely. Right, we're trying to work with this US company that makes it. The R&D is here in Madras, but we're trying to tell them give it to us at cost, the Polaroid model, give it to me at cost and I'll pay you per use. And the per use is so high in India that in less than a year you'll get your money and make real profit. And so we're trying to set those models up, but everything's a challenge. So the venture does some other stuff also. This part is supposed to just stay cash break even, but it also allows me to do monitoring. So just give you an example, a chronic patient, you're a heart patient, you see the doctor today, he says come and see me after six weeks. If you don't have a, some emergency in between, he has no idea what happened to you in those six weeks. right? We have, it's called health radar, if you go to www.evolko.com. It, uh, what it does is, he says, okay, I want your temperature twice a day, I want your blood pressure twice a day, right? So you can see that when the patient comes in, because if the patient does it, he can see that. It actually is more critical, so for uh, chronic diseases, that's fine. The most critical part is in patients who get released from hospital, I'm sorry, I'm getting into, but in patients who get released from hospitals, the doctors say they don't follow a regime. And four weeks later, they're back in the hospital and everyone blames the hospital and or the doctor. So now if the discharge slip is digital and you define what needs to be done and we can define that, look, if he doesn't have his medicine or he doesn't take his blood pressure or whatever, the nurse gets an alert or his spouse gets an alert or his kid in Bangalore or in the US gets an alert, right? And someone reminds him to make sure that he, does, he or she does it. That and if the doctor also prescribes limits, so if any reading goes outside the limit, doctor gets an alert. Right, and the system has other intelligence. So let's say you're a surgical patient. You take your temperature, it's 99. The minute you enter it, the system knows you're a surgical patient. It'll give a snapshot of your medical history with an alert to the doctor. The doctor can see your whole history and can decide whether it's the start of an infection or he can ignore it or whatever. He can decide what to do. Otherwise, he will find out when you have a raging fever and you'll end up in the hospital. Right? So it does that also. So it does a lot of prevention, takes care of that part for the doctor. 
So we, you know, that's sort of how it's structured. That obviously get that's for commercial patients in cities. So our the way we structure, we charge 600 rupees a year annual subscription. The hospital marks it up. So some sell it for 1500, 1200, 1800, 5000. It's up to them. I don't. They collect and give me the money. I don't talk to the patient directly, except at renewal time. Then I go back to the patient. That's sort of how it works. Uh, hello? Sorry. Uh, If he doesn't, someone gets an alert. So your son will get a... Because the system doesn't... System knows I'm supposed to get his blood pressure. Blood pressure reading doesn't come. System will send an alert to whoever you set it up to send it to. That person will call up and say, Papa, you have not eaten the So Papa will say, no, I had it, but I forgot to update the system or whatever. The also from the patient point of view, have a look at what they are. Suppose you've come from the hospital. You've got a swollen ankle. Now you don't know what it means. Now today you'll have to go to the hospital in Delhi, at least it'll take you half a day, wait there, see the doctor and come back. Now you can just take a photograph that, attach it with a message, send it to your doctor. Your doctor will get time an hour or two later, he'll get back to you and tell you, ignore whatever he needs to tell you. So it, the patient saves one trip to the hospital and you paid for the system basically. That's the logic of it. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. So I could uh, recollect one of my professor during my undergrads. Who? Oh, sorry, uh, who's sir? this? Sir. Oh, yeah, up there. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sir, uh, I could recollect one of my professor during my undergrads uh, telling people who are not entrepreneur are just uh, professional slaves. So what do you think about that? Because if that's right, then most of us are going to be that. And uh, was, he, was he talking about himself or? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. Who are not entrepreneurs, who work for others, are just professional slaves. You know, that's a uh, very cynical way of looking at that whole thing. Technically, you are someone, after all, you pay some salary to your servant at home. Similarly, you pay a salary to someone who works for you. Now, that was the old traditional Indian business think a, a malik knocker kind of thing. So, you were the knocker if you worked for someone and they were the malik if they paid your salary. In today's professional organizations and the shortage of talent we have, that isn't so true anymore. I mean, technically, nothing has changed. Someone pays your salary, and but it's not true anymore. Uh, and so, uh, to some extent, the family pressure still exists. Like when you talk about entrepreneurship and new idea, instead of asking what idea, people say why, w uh, why you want to start something of your own. Like, are you done with your boss, sir? What do you think? Yeah, and that's not going to go away. Also, uh, most parents want their kids to be happy, settled, successful. And now, actually. Although it's going away, they want them to be married with kids. But, uh, you know, you have to follow your dream. You don't want to live your whole life uh, telling yourself, I wish I had done this when I had the chance. Yeah, and failure is an acceptable norm today. Earlier, failure was a non accept And earlier, there were no jobs. You've got to remember, when my parents, uh, when I grew up, uh, for my parents, not having a job was really you go from middle class to being lower middle class immediately and my parents were very clear they said they'll support me as long as i'm studying it doesn't matter how much i studied but the minute i stop studying then i'm on my own i have to find a job now that is changing in today's world because people are following their heart more and more in fact i think the biggest thing that the it uh, revolution it services it revolution has done in this country is that for the middle class it has broken that glass ceiling I meet so many kids in college who want to become entrepreneurs right away. Some of them even have an idea. Some of them take a year off college to develop some product. In the IITs, I've seen that happen. And IITs are giving them a year off now to go do your thing, come back a year later and get back into. Right. I think, in my view, I think the BPO industry, as if it grows and when it grows, will actually break that glass ceiling for the lower middle class. For the 300 economically underprivileged, I don't have an answer, but it'll have to be, there has to be a political part of that solution. Industry alone can't do it. At least I don't think it can. I'd love for it to be able to do it, then I just tell the politicians to go to hell and we'll find a solution. But the politicians haven't done a thing in IT. In fact, when I'm asked uh, uh, how did uh, HCL survive, uh, the reason we survived were very simply the budgetary cycles, the regulatory cycles for the government were annual, technology was faster than annual. So they were regulating stuff we weren't, didn't care about. And I always tell people that the closest I came to becoming a smuggler was when once uh, the government thought that 
because semiconductor complex in Chandigarh makes 16K DRAMs, they'll ban the import of 64K and DRAMs, which was at that time, that was the bigger DRAM. And I thought to myself, all I have to do is one briefcase a quarter from Singapore, and we should be able to have all the 64K DRAMs we need for our computers. Right. So as I say, that's the closest I came to becoming a smuggler. But uh, fortunately, Dr. Sheshagiri, who was Director General NIC, put some sense into the government, said you can't do this, you can't stop technology. And in any case, whatever semiconductor complex is making, the watch industry is picking up 100% of it. So what are you guys trying to do? And so that didn't get passed. Thanks. But that's how regulation used to happen. Budgets in the old days, that's what they used to do. Very good afternoon, sir. Sir, uh, you've traveled all across the globe. And uh, how was it to operate uh, in uh, a developing economy like India, a developed economy like USA, and an uh, underdeveloped economy like Africa? Like, how was it different? Yeah, so I, I'll tell you one thing. What you learn from India works in any developing economy. So I remember when we, we had a joint venture with HCL, had a joint venture in Mexico. And there's a, a bread company there, 34 billion, huge, no, not 34, 2 billion, 34 plants all around Mexico. And Mexico had a very poor uh, uh, telecom infrastructure. But like Karnataka, and we did this in Karnataka, buses run very efficiently overnight between Bangalore and every major district uh, town. So for the Karnataka government computer center, they wanted to go online. We used to get floppies put in the bus at night in the district town. In the morning, they would get delivered in Bangalore. He would upload the floppies on his system, and he had all his district data. And that's how we ran the Karnataka government computer center. That's the process we had set up for them. And we did the same thing with a company called Bimbo. We gave the same proposal. We lost, we were the, in the finalist, we were the last two. We lost that because we didn't have enough uh, Spanish-speaking people in the company. And so we lost it to EDS, I still remember. Because, but our solution was considered superior in terms of what it would deliver. Because modems were too slow. And actually, I, now I'm in Karnataka, I remembered. We did it for KGCC. We used to get floppy overnight by bus to Bangalore and then put it into the computer center and give that data. By 9 o'clock, the data would be at Vedan Sabha. Every district, what the status is, you know. But that's the way you have to do it. We didn't have online. I mean, modems were really slow. You just have to do it differently. U.S. is completely different. In fact, the biggest learning in the U.S. was in India, you never did business on the phone because you never knew if the phone would work. In fact, I used to get my briefing in the mornings uh, because in the early morning, you could get trunk calls. So half the time I'd be in my shower when call would come from Madras and uh, my wife would tell me calls from Madras and so I would take five minutes to wipe myself, come out and all. She'd be asking him, okay, what about Ashok Leyland receivable, has it come here? So he'd tell me, yeah, your wife knows everything. I said, no, she hears me on the phone every morning, so she knows the issues. So she's trying to make sure that till I come out, at least some of them, she gets the answers. Otherwise, you know, so, but that's the way business was done in India. In fact, in HCL, all our big offices could pretty much run independently if they wanted. All they had to say was, I tried to call you, I couldn't get through. So I had to take the decision. And there was nothing you could do about it. Because that's the way it was. So you had to make sure that the person that was enabled knew what he would be able to do, would not make a commitment that you felt would not get kept. And if he did, then I would have to fly down and talk to the customer and say, I'm sorry, he said delivery in two weeks. Can't be done in two weeks. It's going to take four weeks or six weeks or whatever. And I'm sorry, so I give some excuse. And But that's the way it used to. We used to run the company. Good afternoon, sir. So my question is regarding a recent subject or course that I've taken where I had to play a game uh, called marketing strategy where we had a team of four and we had to forecast the market and what product to launch and if a product is not working, uh, like do we pull it off or yeah, we yeah. relaunch it doing some uh, R&D on it. So, but the benefit that we had, we had all the data. What market uh, is growing after five years, which is the biggest segment. So, according to that, we could finalize what product to launch. But in your time, it would have been really difficult for you people to like 
forecast the market with no data, I mean internet, limited data. So was it a, like, how did you go about it at the first place and with your thing with budget issue and startup, we just had our grades on stake. You had your career and your investment at stake. So how did you guys go about it? So you just had to be very quick on your feet. You had to keep your ear to the ground. And you just had to make, you know, as I said, you can't have an ego. You can't claim I took this decision, then it has to follow. You change, you admit, hey, it was a mistake, let's do it this way. And everyone did it that way. So, you know, no one in HCL ever went home before 10 o'clock at night. So they'd all come back 5, 6 o'clock. Then it would be a gup session in office. I say, customer ne ye bola, I did this. I, you know, everyone's bragging about something or the other. But you're getting a lot of feedback as to what customers are saying, why they're saying that. And then based on that, you make your decisions on how you want to go in the future. Yes, you've got to sometimes work with very little data. You're not always going to get the data you want. In fact, uh, uh, there are some people I know who find it very difficult to work with uh, they want all the data and according to me, if you get all the data, then why do you have to take a decision? Because the decision is already there for you once all the data is available, right? And um, you have people who have data diarrhea, they keep wanting more and more data without taking decisions. You'll find people like that in companies. But you'll also find the other side who are pure gamblers who will take decisions on very little data, just saying my gut says this and that. Yes, gut is important. It's very important because if you're in an industry, you do have a gut. You have a feeling of where it's going to go and how it's going to go. But yeah, you, and some big decisions go wrong. I'll give you one that I did that was that I think in hindsight was wrong. When we were getting into workstations in CAD CAM, uh, both Sun and Apollo were willing to sign up with us, right? Now, Sun Apollo had technology. Sun had marketing. I looked at India and said, I don't need marketing help. I know how to market in my, sell in my market. I need technology. And so we had a big discussion internally. But as I said, it was my decision. And so while everyone else felt, let's go with Sun, they were giving us 5% equity in their company. They were doing lots of things. I said, no, I need technology. I'll go with Apollo. And over a period of time, I got a lot of flack because Apollo started going down. Sun started ascending as a company. And then things changed. Apollo got bought by HP. And then when we signed a joint venture with HP, Apollo was the trigger that made that happen. And so all of a sudden, everyone said, smart move to go Apollo because we got HP. But who the hell do you? When we signed Apollo, I had no idea that HP would follow at some point. But again, it's a question of, hey, you, whatever you're dealt, you've got to play, ultimately take advantage of whatever cards come into your hand and then see how to maximize that. Don't sit and cry over spilt milk or say, I wish that had happened because it hadn't happened. I mean, you can wish it to happen, nice, give it five seconds, then forget about it and play with what you've got. Thank you, sir. Sorry. Uh, it was an excellent story of enterprise and uh, opportunity of education here. But uh, how do you look at Work-life balance. Uh, well, good thing my wife isn't here, so I can answer this question safely. I don't think you will ever come to an ideal work-life balance. I don't think so. Uh, don't try and chase that ideal. In my view, it doesn't exist. Because I have a friend of mine who uh, thought uh, he could do it and he would come home at 6. And then his wife said, why don't you come home at 5? And then he came up at 5 and she said, you're never here, uh, you know, I get into trouble because my wife tells me that you're never here when you're needed. And I made the mistake of saying, you know, when I'm here, I anticipate and make sure that crisis don't happen. And she had never forgiven me for <laughs> saying something like that. But bottom line is you've got to, f you've got to work it out. It's, there's no one ideal solution for work-life balance. You've got to work it out, your health. You got to look at your priorities. You got to look at what you need to do. You got to, yeah. It just is. Uh, you just got to find a way that makes sense for you, makes sense for the people who are sort of dependent on you or who you are. You want to spend time with, and uh, try and do it. And there's always a conflict. There's always a conflict. And you'll take some wrong decisions. You'll take some right decisions. But it's not going. It hasn't sorted itself out for me. And I've been working since 1970, so that's 48 years. I think my wife 
has still not given up trying to say I need to do something about it. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's tough. I, there is no answer as far as I, I don't have the answer. So I'm the wrong guy to ask that. I'm in trouble every day of my life. Uh, I didn't have an arranged marriage. But you are a successful entrepreneur. So what's the lesson here? Yeah, but I I had to take a decision about who to get married. That itself is a big decision, right? And uh, you got to do it, uh, at least in the old days, you did it. You hardly, you couldn't take out people too often. You couldn't, you know. I had I was a little lucky because Lalit was my friend. I could go to the house in the excuse that I'm going to sit and talk to him. That was, you know, sort of my excuse. I could never... I, I never called my to-be wife out. In fact, I used to get one of my friends to do it. So when uh, my wife, uh, Kiran, told her mother, she decided who she's going to get married to, her mother thought of that friend who would call her out. Right? <laughs> and of course, you know, my, my good books were, when she said it was me, her mother's first reaction was, oh, but he's such a nice guy. No problem. And by the way, I've got to tell you uh, how I got on my mother-in-law's good side. So one year after I got married, my mother-in-law thought she knew me well enough. So she sat me down and said, how did you decide to marry this tomboy, middle child, hellion, and blah, blah. So I told her something my father told me when I was supposed to be going to the US. And telephones weren't easy in those days. So he said, you know, you're in the US. Uh, you might you get into a situation where you need to take a decision to get married. And you want to talk to your parents, but your can't get through to them. So from my side, just go look at the girl's mother and say 20, 25 years later, is that the person I want to live with? And if the answer is yes, then assume I've said yes. So I told my mother-in-law exactly the same thing and I never had a problem with her after that. <laughs> so remember, that's a really good line and it's actually true. So it's not just a line. It's amazing. I see my wife becoming like her mother and she she also talks about it and says, oh, I'm, I, my mom used to do this. I'm also doing it. I can't believe it kind of thing. But they can't help it. They just, that's the way they bought up. But I had a sponsor, rather, uh, Please, please keep sitting. That is, uh, that is, you know, this work-life you know, balance is not a problem for men, actually. For women entrepreneurs, yeah, that's, that's a very big problem. In fact, I... <coughs> I happened to go go through a video of uh, Nuri. Nuri Indira, Indira Nuri, yes. And she said that this was a critical issue yes, for her. It's very clear. You know, in her career. Hundred percent. It's actually two things that are. Um, how should I put it? That are. This is. You're absolutely right. It's actually a bigger problem for them, and you know, God bless them. I don't know how they do it, but it it is tough. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was. You know, I was asked this question once that someone had just joined this company. I was giving a talk and he said, you know, I need to adjust in this new company. How do I do it? You know, can you give me some hints? And I said, look, you know, I don't know how to do it, but are you married? He said, yes. Do you live with your parents? He said, yes. He said, now ask your wife. She'd be the best person to tell you how to adjust in a new environment that's completely alien and fit in as if you're part of the environment. And I think women are the best people to give you that advice. Because it, the, right, right. Except that the people have hang-ups. Yeah. Except that it just takes, you know, your whole life. It becomes the focus of your life. So if you've got family and if you've got, you've got to have a very understanding husband for one. If you're married. Uh, if you're not, then of course that doesn't go. And you know, if you're married and children. Uh, you've got to make sure that the children get, you know, get the attention they're supposed to get. Someone's got to give it to them. And, you know, times are changing. I have a number of classmates of mine who are house husbands. Yeah, we used to, I used to find it odd, but, you know, uh, it worked very well for them. And uh, it's starting to become more and more, and more uh, like that as you see people around the world. I, I actually, I look at the U.S. and see how much time, what I find really strange is, Parents uh, spend more time with their kids there 
but when they become teenagers they sort of let them go completely which is quite unlike here where we spend a lot less time with our kids fussing over them but we sort of hang on to them for a lot longer <laughs> and just remember for your parents you've never grown up i remember coming back from the us in 92 to run the hcl hp joint venture and i was 40 years old or near 40 and i was going out i was staying with my parents and i was leaving monday and i took the car keys and uh, my mother said uh, uh, don't be too late and so i gave her the raised eyebrow said what are you saying completely unfazed she said and don't drink too much <laughs> <laughs> so you know they you sort of never grow up for them yeah of course i got my mother shocked on my 50th birthday she asked me what i would like and i told her i'd like a diamond mundri for my ear you should see the face <laughs> so i have a very simple question to ask to you like throughout your professional career you have seen lot of success and it has been said that every successful person has have certain habits or certain things which he practice daily which make him different from other people so which made me curious to know like what habits do you practice daily or what are the things you do daily which make you different from other people and made you successful so yeah that's a good question i can i don't know what i do different to other people because i don't really know what other people do but a couple of things i do that i think make me who i am one is i try to be myself i you know i look at a lot of people i learn try and learn what i think our strengths from them and then i try and i try not to be them but to try and be myself and inculcate those strengths if i use that term because you got to remember a copy is never as good as the original and you are the original so don't try and be someone else be yourself but try and get those attributes into who you are that's number 1 number 2 uh, you know before i go to sleep Uh, five minutes, ten minutes or so. I always think about the day and what have I done, good or bad, that uh, or which opportunity did I miss for doing something that I thought would be good. And you know, a lot of times you say something you didn't mean to say, and because you're angry at that time, you go away. So if I, when I think about it, and if I think I was wrong. then i try and get up the next morning and when i meet that person i apologize for hey i didn't really mean it i hope it's okay it doesn't always work but at least it makes you feel good that hey i you know i find most people find it very difficult to apologize i also try and do one thing see when you're selling you have to be a little different to people so when i used to go let's say example to the iits in the old days you go selling in the middle of summer the only place they had a refrigerator was in the director's office so you would go there at lunch time and you would ask the director's pa for a glass of water and he'd crib like hell but he'd give it because yeah it's hot and and so at the end of the day 5 o'clock 6 o'clock when you're finishing i'd always go back to the director's office to the pa and just say thank you and go away now very few people in india say thank you he would remember that so if i ever needed 5 minutes with the director to get some purchase requisition signed he would find time for me in between two meetings to get me in there and get it done right didn't take very much doesn't cost you very much simple thing also when we were running the company we noticed a lot of our people would take half day off a lot of them would get frustrated and want overseas postings and all so we tried to find out the reason and yeah most of these guys are bachelors they're living in apartments they got to pay their electricity bill poor guy has to not poor guy but the guy is standing in line to pay the electricity bill some tout is coming and cutting the line if you object wo gali wali ho jata hai you know all that kind of stuff and it's a very frustrating experience because in your mind you think yeah this really uneducated lout and i'm standing in this line and all that blah blah you know it's just frustrating so what we did was we got a contract service and we said that your electricity bills and any other bills you got to pay if you give it to this guy he'll in a day or two he'll give you back your receipt you don't have to go and do it and of course we did it for dry cleaning also and stuff like that you know it cost us i think that electricity bill guy cost us 5000 rupees a month plus whatever conveyance it was voted the nicest thing the company has done for me 
So it's not, you know, money is important, but it's not, it's the small things. You've got to, you got to show people you care. Again, you get the MBA students, you've heard of the Hawthorne experiment, <laughs> right? No. No, yes. yes. Hey, you know the Hawthorne experiment. So you know what Taylor did and, you know, the lights going off and on and just people said the productivity went up because someone cares, even when the lights went off. So, you know, uh, that's true. That's true in anything that you do. It's true whether you're talking to senior people, you're talking to blue collar, talking to anyone. It's very important to just give them that little pat on the back. And the other thing in India that makes a difference is treat people like they're human beings. Don't treat people like just because he's a clerk, he is inferior. And most people actually respond to that when you treat them like, I mean, I've had, how should I put it, trying to get payments out on time. I've had so many cups of tea and smoked how many BDs with people. But, you know, that's just it. If that's what that guy feels, he, he, that you would then consider him or her an equal, that's exactly what you've got to do. But yeah, again, doesn't cost you very much, doesn't take very much, but it differentiates you as a person with the other person. And when you're in sales especially, that's very important that people remember you for you. Uh, thank you, sir. I think oh, we got a you yeah. have a question? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think someone raised Last yeah, question, go. guys. Closer, closer, get it closer. No, take the other one. Hello. Okay. I'm audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you told that as you grow in your career, you need to control, I mean, you need to reduce your ego over the period. So ego is nothing but where your point is always better than others' point. I mean, at least in a business or in a in any situation. So how do you manage it? Like, uh, even if you know you're right, how do you manage it? So you've got to learn the art of getting, how sh let me try and put the words right. You've got to learn the art of trying to get your idea into the other guy's head as if it's his idea. Okay. It's, it's a way to do it. And then the guy will own it. See, I've always noticed when I tell people to do something and they don't believe in it or don't own it, there's a high probability that it won't get done either in time or the way you want. But if the other person owns it like it's their idea, then it'll all, by and large, it'll get done. So if you think you're right and someone else is wrong, I'm not, occasionally you have to put your thing down and say, hey, this is the way we're going to do it. Let's all accept that. But that's very occasionally. Normally, you've got to find a nice way of putting it into someone else's head and say, what a great idea. You know, let's expand on this and make that person own the idea, although it's your idea. Then it makes it. You can't be an autocrat and say, yeah, he karna hai, and I may bol raha to theek hai, and all. After a while, people will stop. I mean, uh, they won't even listen to you. Right? Yes, you're the boss, they'll be polite, stuff like that. But, and so, in most meetings, you've got to do most of the listening. And try and keep people, what happens in most meetings is people are making points on each other. Try and get them to get to, hey, stick to the issues. And if you're making points on each other, then I'm going to take the decision, and you guys have to live with it. I normally find that works because then everyone's worried because, you know, they're worried that you may tell them to do something they don't want to do. So they'll give up that trying to uh, point fingers or whatever and get to the issues. But try and meetings try and stick to the issues. And if you stick to the issues, you'll normally find a good discussion. Most of them get hijacked into someone uh, subtly trying to say that guy is screwed up here and you finger pointing of some kind which never gets you anywhere. So I just have one more question. Uh, uh, so you, uh, it's, I mean, it's been a long time since you're working. So you've gone, I mean, you've met a lot of startups and you, you tell that you really like to get into startups more. So uh, startups are more of, you know, it's more of tension, it's more of hard work, it's more of, uh, it's literally on fire because you have huge investments, you have people's, people's passion, they want to grow, you know, they want to see themselves in, as a million dollar company someday, you know, and they want to, uh, you know, you know, divers in different countries and all. So they have a lot of dreams. So how is it to, uh, you know, be a part of their dream and work with them? Is it your passion that uh, makes you, you know, like uh, one among them or is it, uh, or is it something else that carries out? 
Yeah, so the way I look at startups, uh, startups are like babies. You can influence them, you can put the value system in there, you can do all that. And you know, it's a question of uh, how do you like your children? Do you like them zero to two years old? Do you like them two to five or six? Do you like them as teenagers? How do you like your kid? Because in every phase in a company's life, it's somewhat similar. And really, I really like that zero to five million, if I use that phrase. Because after that, things are set, and there are people who work in HP and all who can come and do as good or better job than I can do. But they can't, they don't seem to be able to. So in fact, my wife asks me that question all the time, that why do you keep working? And my answer to her is simply, as long as I can create jobs, I think it's my duty as an Indian to keep working. Because if you can create jobs, the day I think I can't create jobs, then I'll hang up my boots and do some, and look after my stamps or my coins or all my other hobbies that I have. <laughs> which are getting neglected completely. But, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really, uh, uh, there's a thrill because you can, you set the value system, you set the norms, you, you can influence everything in a baby when a baby is young. As they grow up, the environment and what they already influence starts playing a part, right? And the minute you get to a certain point, uh, managing people becomes much more important than managing the business. Because if you've got good people, they've all got egos, and they all think they know what's right. And suddenly managing them becomes a real big issue. Uh, and that, that's part of any growing company. So. Thank you, sir. Life is going to be a continuous education. There's no way, if you want to progress in your career, there's no way. Earlier it was the IT industry, which I used to say that you have to keep learning all the time. Now IT has become so pervasive in every industry, or is becoming part of the infrastructure of every industry, that there's no way you can not keep yourself updated with what's going on. And if you don't, you're going to become irrelevant in whatever industry you're in. So just keep that. It's unfortunate, but uh, you have to. Keep learning. You have to keep yourself uh, learning. So find a way of doing that. I, I don't have the answer. Maybe uh, Myra will set up a continuous education program that hopefully will help you through part of that. But you just have to keep learning. So just keep that in mind.